it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Something about the ocean always terrified me. It's the sheer depth of it. All that darkness waiting below the surface. And you have no idea how far it really goes. You're just treading water. And in that moment, you are prey. And people don't seem to extend the same courtesy to the cosmos, but they should. It's so inconceivably vast that there's no real frame of reference for it. The Challenger Deep is 11,000 meters below sea level, but when we look up at the sun, sitting on that pale blue curtain that hides us from the beyond, that's millions of kilometers, thousands of trips around the Earth. That's less than a pinprick on the universe's skin. It doesn't even register. So many people are eager to see what lurks behind the threshold, but they never ask themselves if they should, because sometimes our insignificance is our shield. I remember when the sky started to change, Sitting back in the Osprey with Jeffries, Barry, Tanner and Sprite, another breach fire team seated across from us. We had no idea what was about to happen, but we could taste it when the clouds began to twist into the violent, roiling chaos of the unknown, and the air was like raw meat upon the tongue, the scent of blood and fuel riding on the wind. We'd been dosed with psilocybin as a precaution against psychological trauma, but out there it was useless. We could all feel it, this horrible existential dread as the ocean passed beneath us, and adrenaline flooded through our veins, even when we were still so far away from danger. I remember thinking about that moment when we were cowering in the safe room at HQ, the bomb at our backs while the traveller in command stood before us. And what help are we going to be compared to this guy? asked Jeffries, eyes on the towering armoured figure the dark plating of his design swimming across him like liquid metal. It is your duty to serve, bellowed the deep, half-mechanical voice of the Traveller. The spawn of the elemental are a stain upon existence. They must be cleansed. They will help us, Command clarified. But even then, victory is not at all guaranteed. We are compounding a sentient universe that they call an elemental an aspect of a primal concept or emotion, and the Ascendants have nearly rejoined it to this plane. It's in its naturally dormant state right now, hence the event that suffered it from before Blood Siren. But any connection with our world is a danger, and when it wakes up, the first thing it will do is assimilate our universe. And the bomb? asked one of the other breach operators. The Traveller looked at him. A contingency to ensure the purity of our blessed reality, said the Traveller. The smallest iota of corruption is as much a threat as the largest, but the destruction of this divine cosmos is not a matter that we take in stride. The Elemental endures a cycle of death and creation that is bound to follow, marked by two cataclysmic events. Just as you require oxygen to survive, it must require the essence of its making and the cycle ensures that it always has room to feed, for death begets life, when life requires a garden to flourish. You are blessed to have been invaded during the first of these events, which severed his grip upon this universe. You are not so fortunate, however, to have harbored the presence of ascendants on this planet, for they indeed have the power to draw this universe back into the mindless jaws of the enemy. And what are the ascendants? asked Jeffreys. What are we fighting? They are living embodiments of whatever profane aspect this element represents. In this case, it is surrender, said the traveller. Thanks to the Prometheus Mandate, the Elemental never strictly invaded us, per se, said Command. It's only a matter of time before it traditionally did so, but it was only here because of their meddling. The town you secured on Blood Siren was a site of their experimentation. They exposed the entire population to the psychic proximity of the Elemental, destroying their minds and compelling them to create the portal within the sewers. The smaller breaches were merely incidental. The portal was weak, however, and only three ascendants managed to cross. Any number must be purged, said the Traveller. 
A lone ascendant could conquer this universe without effort. Quite right, said Command. And thankfully, we now know exactly where they are. This attack was a bit of desperation on the part of Prometheus. I imagine they were only granted darkling assets for the sheer amusement of the Ascendants. They wanted to capture the fallen paladin in your previous operation, and use his knowledge of souls to disarm the bomb, but thankfully you were able to get to him first. Prometheus was very much under the darkling's thrall, but they were more of a plaything than a resource. The darklings do not need help assimilating a universe. So, you know where they are said Jeffries. Then what's next? Simple, said Command. When we have recovered and prepared, we'll launch a full-scale assault on the Darkling stronghold in this world, with the aim of assassinating the three Ascendants and permanently sealing the portal that they are trying to open. The Travelers are willing to combat the three Ascendants on our behalf, but they'll need our full support if they're to stand a chance. Do they really? asked Barry in disbelief. Do not forsake your value, said the Traveller. None of your kind have ever slain an Ascendant in single combat, and even when our numbers are great, a moment's lapse in concentration can spell our doom. You must cleanse the lesser Darklings that defend them if we are to be effective. And that we will, said Command. We'll be enlisting the aid of several countries in our attack to cover for our weakened numbers, and we'll strike by land and sea, but, as I said... Success is not guaranteed. If that portal opens, there's no telling what might be waiting for us on the other side. If our benefactors so much as get a hint of a full-scale invasion, they motion to the bomb. Our universe is forfeit. Sometime after that, before we deployed, we were each given a device of sorts that we were told would seal the portal forever. All we had to do was cast it inside as soon as it became active, and, assuming that the travellers could kill the Ascendants, all this would be over. The thing about plans, though, is that it's not always about the destination. Sometimes it's about the journey, and that journey can be more cruel than you can imagine. I fiddled with a little sphere in my artificial hands, watching the violent light of the sky reflect upon its metallic surface. We passed over a fleet of destroyers, headed in the same direction, while several other transports flew alongside us, the blades of Ospreys and UH-60Ms chopping upon the air. Sometimes we'd hear the roar of a jet engine, and a sonic boom would crack through the atmosphere in the wake of a B-1 Lancer. The travellers were flying at a safe distance from the rest of us, because the proximity of their ship would give us brain damage, but they would support us as soon as we made landfall. We were all equipped with as many electrical cannons as possible, but only a handful had been scavenged from the off-world bunker, so most of our forces were still using railguns. In our fire team, only Jeffries and myself had the ability to seriously harm the Darkling Legionnaires. The rest could only do what they could, because R&D had no way of replicating the Crest technology, and the weapons of the Travellers weren't meant to be wielded by the human body. Sprite was being unusually close with Jeffries that day. He actually let Jeffries hold him, sitting next to me in the Osprey while my eyes were locked on the darkening sky behind us. A red glow began to shine through the interior, and I turned to see a full moon break through the clouds from the cockpit window, shimmering with a crimson light beyond the purple, noxious miasma. It was like we were staring at the moon of another world, and yet somehow it was here. The radio crackled to life. Command to all fire teams. Drop ETA in two minutes. Take the beachhead and mark strike locations. Over. We've got a visual, said one of the pilots. We all looked to see the island in the distance, set beneath the glow of the red moon. Tangles of meat wound up from the water to form living beaches, coalescing around a towering ascent of shifting flesh. Bizarre structures jutted up from the mountainous viscera, forming walls and fortifications of ebony stone, their architecture caught between an otherworldly eroticism and a nauseating horror. The curvature of every surface and every spire of blackened razors seemed to hint at some perverse, carnal equivalent, 
vicious thorns lining the ruinous battlements as though set to hang the flayed corpse of any would-be intruders. And that was when everything went wrong. I watched as three figures rose into the air above the island, their dark cloaks riding the wind like oil upon water, until at last they fell still. Even from so far away, I recognised one of them as the ascendant beneath the town in Blood Siren, instilling that very same sense of otherworldly fear. They gestured each of them with their hands, as though performing a dread ritual, and the air around them began to ripple and bend. They heard the radio crackle to life, but before another word could be said, an immense shockwave ripped outward from the three ascendants, throwing back the clouds and sweeping across the ocean. The concussive blast slammed into us, and I was knocked back against my seat as the metal interior caved in around me, and the Osprey swung into an uncontrollable spin. Through the back of the aircraft, I could see the remainder of the shockwave overtake the fleet of destroyers overturning them all in a massive tidal wave as the other Ospreys and transport ships plummeted from the sky. I almost thought I'd pass out from the G-force bearing down on my body as the world spun violently around me, my friends holding on for their lives at my side. With a deafening crash, I was suddenly thrown out of my seat and up against the tattered ceiling of the Osprey as we smacked straight into the ocean, a flood of water rushing into the interior. I tried to gain my bearings, but the oncoming waves slammed me back against the cockpit. The blood, the severed pilots dancing across my vision while we rapidly sank into the murky depths. The water failed to penetrate my armour, but I couldn't breathe, and I was so flooded with adrenaline that I couldn't tell which way was up. Then Jeffries grabbed me by the arm and pulled me back into the interior. Getting my mind on track, I saw the others swimming alongside me, and apart from the pilots, we had no casualties among our number. Emerging from the sinking wreck, I saw the violet light of the clouds shining through the surface in great, scintillating rays, and I followed my compatriots up into the glow. I surfaced above the crashing waves, taking in a deep breath of air as the sound of battle immediately met my ears. A B-1 Lancer tore overhead and loosed its payload upon the island beyond consuming the unseen distance in streaks of billowing white phosphorus. Swim to the shore, yelled Jeffries. Hurry! I began to swim through the crashing waves that threatened to pull me under at every advance, while Sprite surfaced ahead of us and tore forward above the sea, unleashing a volley of laser fire across the flesh-hewn beach in a streak of pluming flames, where several legionnaires fought with the landed forces. Each clad in a full plate of blackened razors, they cleaved their vicious, medieval weapons through all who assailed them, while the breach fire teams unleashed electrical shockwaves from their cannons that disintegrated them in bursts of flaming gore. I soon felt my boots hit the earth beneath the waves, and I crawled forward onto the shore, rising to my feet on the blood-soaked surface of knotted viscera. The legionnaire immediately charged toward me, great sword raised in the air, only for Sprite to lash his lasers around his face, knocking him back and giving me enough time to raise my electrical cannon and pull the trigger. The weapon kicked back against my shoulder and loosed a thundering shockwave that instantly vaporized the legionnaire's upper body, the remainder of his corpse collapsing to the ground. Command to all units, crackled the radio. Naval bombardment has been compromised. Move forward and support the travelers wherever you can. Closure of the gate is our number one priority. Do not fail us. Our universe depends on it. Ahead of us, twin spires of blackened razors stood atop a range of mountainous flesh, creating a wide choke point that marked the ascent to the center of the island. A contingent of legionnaires rushed down from the steps of winding meat and dark hexagonal tiles, railgun blasts uselessly sparking against their armor from the advancing soldiers at our side. The legionnaires began to conjure eldritch spells within their grip and quickly lashed them at us, volleys of fireballs exploding against the wicked terrain and blasting men to pieces, while a bolt of lightning struck me dead on, knocking me to the ground and seizing every body in my muscle in a surge of overwhelming pain. My armor was burnt, but not broken. 
and I watched as Jeffries, Barry, Tanner and Sprite opened fire with the other breach operators, bombarding the darkling forces with a cascade of electrical shockwaves. Then a legionnaire conjured a freezing wave of ice that rushed against us and locked the others where they stood, chilling tendrils of crystallizing water vapor ensnaring their armor. The strength of their exoskeletons began to free them, and I rose to my feet to lend my aid, breaking chunks of ice off Barry's joints while Sprite started to carefully burn the frost away from Jeffries and Tanner. The legionnaires were advancing, however, and quickly closed the distance, charging into the soldiers and breach fire teams with their weapons swinging. Then, a piercing whine cut through the air, and a seething light shone down from above. I looked up and saw the flowing, arrow-like ship of the travellers descending from the clouds. Waves of crackling electricity flowed down the arcs of the vessel, before lashing forth at the choke point ahead of us, streaking through the legionnaires in a flash of blinding radiance. I felt the heat of the blast rush against me, but when I opened my eyes, the legionnaires were gone, wisps of ash drifting upon the howling wind in their wake, while the flesh of the terrain had been scorched into charred blackness. I looked back at the ship, struggling to maintain eye contact with the shuddering and painful sight. Twelve travellers dislodged from beneath the craft, floating down through the air as though gravity had no meaning, before landing in the unseen distance ahead of us. The ship began to turn, but before it could, a dread shape shot forth into the sky. It was an ascendant, and yet it wasn't, as though it had abandoned any pretense of humanity shedding its skin for a form of fluidic, smoke-wreathed teeth and coalescing insectile limbs that refracted through a thousand angles at once, appearing and disappearing in several different places around the ship before ensnaring it in its winding grip. With a resonating groan and a thunderous explosion, it ripped the craft in two, hurling its remains into the ocean. The Ascendant whirled back into its earthly visage, its cloak dancing in its wake, while a staccato of sonic booms cracked through the air, and three F-16s rapidly flew toward it, loosing a volley of missiles. The mass descendant raised its hand, and the flight of aircraft instantly disintegrated in clouds of billowing dust, the missiles harmlessly detonating against it in a series of fiery explosions. We moved up through the passage, several fire teams of soldiers advancing ahead of us, while just above, Insectile horrors swept across the sky, like shrieking airborne spiders kept aloft by their tattered, bat-like wings. I almost thought I could hear drumming in the distance, beneath the echoing booms of combat, beating through a fevered, ritualistic chanting. The moon burning overhead, we emerged upon a field of ruined, otherworldly structures. While beyond, a massive ring of woven corpses stood at the highest peak a gem of void hovering within it, while two ascendants poured their energy into its design. The weapons of the travellers flared and thundered in the distance, but their battle was obscured by the walls of flowing ebony metal, entangled by roots of sinew and thorns. Gunfire rattled upon the air as the soldiers met with another contingent of legionnaires on the right side of the ruins, and two breach fire teams moved to support them, while we and another group moved to the left, taking what little cover we could behind the blasted walls, that for all I knew looked like they'd been indiscriminately teleported from an alien world. Braziers burned with violet fire, while smoking tents of flesh were stricken across the expanse, like the demolished campsite of an occult gathering brought together to witness the apocalypse. Cages of bone and runic metal held the burnt cadavers of the darkling captives, felled in the bombings that preceded our arrival while crosses jutted up from the wicked landscape, displaying the crucified and disemboweled remains of innumerable men. They had been bringing people there to feast upon their suffering, and feed their souls to the portal. Yet still those adherents writhed beneath the seething moonlight, scorched, bleeding, and on the verge of oblivion. Countless celebrants beat their drums and danced across the battlefield, naked and scarred with vicious runes, while others joined in blasphemous orgies, moaning in delirium as their flesh melted and boiled upon their bones. The soldiers gunned them down without pity, yet the adherents didn't seem to mind, 
welcoming the pain of death as though it were only a step on a long and terrible journey to come. One of the massive, flying arachnids descended from the sky and slammed down upon the team ahead of us, impaling two of their number on its sharp and skittering limbs. The others opened fire on it, knocking it back with electrical shockwaves that tore against it in bursts of vaporizing gore. But then it recoiled and loosed a spatter of vicious spit that ignited and exploded upon everything it struck, blasting us all back against the ground and outright killing several men. Shaking the flaming saliva from my armor, I snatched my weapon off the corrupted earth and fired at the advancing aberration, the others joining it until the beast finally collapsed to the bleeding earth. I moved forward and started to help Tanner up while Sprite attacked a legionnaire, blinding it for a fire team of soldiers that slowly brought it down with their concentrated railgun blasts. Tanner buckled down under his own weight, falling against me. That's when I noticed that he was missing his legs. Stop, Tanner said. I can't. I carefully set him back down, Barry and Jeffries quickly joining us, but they were only stricken with superficial burns. Jeffries swore, examining Tanner's injuries. You're not bleeding, said Barry. Burnt the wounds right shut. Don't worry, man. You're going to survive this. I can't feel my lower body, said Tanner, Everything's numb. It's just a shock, said Jeffries. We'll get you back down to the beach. Don't worry. Just stay awake, okay? No, said Tanner, shaking his head. You move up and you don't look back. You need to do this, all of you. If I'm going to live, then I'll be right here. Now, give him hell. Jeffries nodded, gripping his weapon tight. Oh, you can count on that, he said rising to his feet. These things fucked with the wrong planet. Leaving Tanner behind, Jeffries led us forward through the twisting ruins, gunning down several legionnaires as we quickly approached the center of the island, and the rank corpses of three travelers slipped into view. It was beyond disturbing to see them dead. When I had witnessed one of them single-handedly save us from the Prometheus at HQ, in the distance ahead, an ascendant fought with four travelers, flashing toward each other in a melee that moved so fast it almost appeared like a skipping film, the combatants teleporting through the air as their armoured fists cracked against the Ascendant so hard that concussive shockwaves were loosed from every blow. The Ascendant wove through their attacks like liquid, dodging the majority of their attempts, before retaliating with a blast of burning antimatter, knocking one of the travellers back. It snatched another up in its grip and effortlessly ripped him in two, casting his remains against the earth in a splatter of blood and cybernetic organs. Another traveller engaged the Ascendant in melee, while a second raised his hand to it, projecting a beam of void that sliced through the air and cut through the distracted Ascendant in a spatter of indigo blood. The Ascendant stumbled, and the traveller next to it rammed his fists into its skull, striking it again and again in a cascade of thundering boom. The Ascendant split open where it had been cut, revealing a vertical maw of razor-sharp teeth that clamped down on the Traveller and swallowed him whole. While it messily chomped upon the armoured corpse, it raised its flayed hand to another Traveller and telekinetically suspended him in the air. It cleansed his fist, and the Traveller imploded with a sickening crunch, blood squirting out of his shattered exoskeleton. The flesh is weak whispered the Ascendant in a voice that paralyzed every nerve in my body. But the soul is eternal. You shall be remade in our image. Another breach team reached the battle before us, and opened fire on the Ascendant with their electrical cannons, momentarily distracting it while the surviving traveller flashed forward to it, and grabbed hold, his armor glowing with crackling power while he screamed with rage. Raising his fist, he plunged it into the Ascendant's flailing maw, and the Ascendant exploded with a shockwave that knocked everyone to the ground, my ears ringing as the toxic clouds were thrown back over me. Shaking off the disorientation, I scrambled to my feet and saw the strewn remains of the Ascendant and the Traveller who'd sacrificed himself to kill it. Its splattered flesh bled into the earth like starry wounds in reality, but ultimately it had been destroyed. 
these creatures were not immortal. Our rallied forces advanced toward the summit, where the second ascendant fought five of the travellers back, and the third guarded the portal while the hovering gemstone gathered its power, the air lensing around it like a well of tremendous gravity. Silence, rasped the second ascendant in a thousand scraping voices. It loosed a telekinetic shockwave that slammed into the travellers with a vicious crack, and knocked them back across the bleeding earth. You are not our prey, mortals. You are the recipients of our gift. Open your eyes and let them burn upon the gates of paradise. The third ascendant raised its hand to the air, and the gem burst into an infinite blackness, spreading out across the frame of the portal until it was little more than a slate of utter darkness. But that darkness called to my mind, drawing it in with an unshakable gravity as the world around us began to shimmer and blur. Time seemed to slow, and a horrifying sense of dread overwhelmed me, until everything came crashing together at once, as though the island itself had been catapulted across the ocean at the speed of sound, the sky ripped back into a stellar void, and with a deafening boom, a dread fortress shunted into existence from across the distant waters. It was like an occult citadel of bleached white stone set upon a backdrop of absolute darkness as the stars shuddered deliriously above, and at its farthest peak a crescent of marble framed the full pale moon, burning in the sky as though superimposed upon the world. I beckon thee, Lord in white, rasped the ascendant, the wave of existential dread overtaking me. Wake our sisters, for the traitorous flesh yearns to be tempered. The moon split open into a massive, dilated eye that locked upon us with a ravenous hunger, his iris stained with all the colours that broke my mind and burned my skin for even existing in their presence. Then it was like time stood still around me. Pebbles and dust began to rise above the ground, as though suspended with an unnatural gravity, and as the terrain beneath me started to blur and sink into an inky viscosity, the scourge of tiny ebony roots pierced the veil of reality, slowly poking up through the hellscape that surrounded me. I began to cry uncontrollably, like my mind was suddenly flooded with emotion, and I wanted nothing more than to escape from whatever was coming. But my brain was so overwhelmed with stimuli that I couldn't even crawl away if I wanted to. The other soldiers and breach fire teams started to charge the portal, clutching the objects that would seal it forever, but it was useless. The air itself seemed to rush into the third ascendant, and with a deafening boom it loosed a psychic shockwave of staggering power, surging toward us in the blink of an eye. Yet, in that moment, Sprite swept down before us and summoned a shield of flickering energy. The shockwave hit, and the other fire teams were instantly disintegrated, their gore splattering across the earth. We, however, were unharmed, save for Sprite who laid motionless upon the ground. He was gone. I stumbled back, rivers of blood flowing beneath my boots, while Jeffreys looked down at Sprite in shock. The second ascendant exploded nearby with a deafening boom as the travellers overcame it, nearly knocking me off my feet. But the final ascendant was still alive. Irrelevant, it said, unbothered by the death of its kin. One of the remaining three travellers tried to slip past it and seal the portal, but the Ascendant snatched him out of the air with its mind and ripped the soul from his bones, devouring it with a rasping hiss and tossing the empty shell of his body to the ground. It turned to us, then, raising its hand and paused in a brief moment of recognition. I knew, in that moment, that it was the one we'd spoken with. Fear not, it whispered through my thoughts. Death is not the end. It loosed a psychic shockwave, and Barry vaporized right in front of me, his blood splattering against my armor as I was knocked to the ground, and every bone in my body shattered instantaneously. I screamed in absolute suffering, the taste of blood flooding my mouth. It hurt so much that it was almost numbing, and nearby I saw Jeffreys in the smoking ashes. His armor had been blasted away, and his wounds were gushing blood, but he'd been knocked aside by the blast, and was still well enough to move. He crawled to his hands and knees, 
looking over at me with tears in his eyes. And with a single, uniform purpose, he snatched Barry's discarded comms equipment off the ground and sprinted toward the open portal. The Ascendant never noticed. It was too occupied with fighting the two remaining travellers, sucking the soul out of one and blasting the other back in a burst of antimatter. My vision began to darken, blood leaking from my wounds. But the last thing I saw was Jeffrey's, leaping headlong into the blackness of the portal and disappearing within. The void imploded in his wake, as though everything were collapsing upon a single point in space. And then the loudest sound I ever heard shot through the air, and the world went dark. I didn't expect to survive. I shouldn't have survived, but I did. I woke up at what's currently passing for HQ, but now it's mostly just a holding cell for the bomb. Breach is dead. Everybody's dead, except for command, and nobody's told me anything. I can't describe the level of pain that I was in when I came to. Now, physical pain is one thing, but I felt like I'd been hollowed out from the inside. My best friend was killed right in front of me, and I can't get it out of my head. It's like it's been burned into my mind forever. It's just so sudden. Jeffries is gone. Sprite is dead. Only Tanner and I are left. Tanner's paralyzed and will never walk again, and neither will I. I'm being kept alive by the things they did to me, but I don't feel like describing it. I don't feel like doing anything. I don't know. Other than that, I'm stuck here. Tanner and I are confined to a comms room, and I'm writing this out while we wait for any sort of signal from Barry's navgear which Jeffries took with him into the portal. I doubt that Jeffrey survived, but it's the only thing keeping the two of us going, keeping us distracted. Otherwise our thoughts can, well, get a little too dark. In any case, our mysterious benefactors are all dead, and as for the Darklings, I'm not entirely sure what happened. There was one surviving traveller when I was knocked out, but I find it unlikely that he was able to kill the last descendant. And nobody's telling me anything. Even if he did, they seem to be quite unconcerned with dying, so a part of me is afraid they still exist in some incorporeal form that only needs another body to possess. We don't know what's going to happen with the bomb either, but it's not like the travellers will be reporting back, unless it turns out that Command was one of them. A handful of survivors were evacuated, along with any traveller tech that could be salvaged. And then we nuke the island with one of the Crest Cobalt Bombs. You won't hear a whisper about it on the news, so don't bother. But I'm guessing some sea life is about to die. Hold on. Something's beeping. It's him. I don't know how, but we just got a message from Jeffries. The brass is coming in here right now, so I'll have to go. But I will keep you posted. I promise. So there we are, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, I have taken my time, haven't I? But there we are. Episode 12 of Breach. Finally done and dusted. Oh, one more to go. Are you shivering with anticipation? <laughs> I certainly hope so. Okay, so here's my plan. I'm going to get that one out very soon. Um, a standalone final episode. But I'll also be putting all 13 episodes together in one long vid so you can enjoy the whole saga in one sitting. Sound good? I hope so. Well, that's my plan anyway. Um, well, yeah, <laughs> there you go. I've been taking my time on this one. Oh, it's been more than a year to get the breach shirt done and dusted, but finally getting towards the end. Well, my dear friends, a um, couple of videos this evening. Hope you enjoyed both of them. Pushing a couple of series forward. And, uh, well, yeah, there you are. Back again tomorrow night. Don't know where, don't know when, but a totally original, standalone story for you tomorrow evening. Till then, my dear friends, very, very sweet dreams, and bye-bye.